So we said, brothers and sisters, that the, the word disciple means to learn, to be a learner. And if we have learned, then we become the learned. So discipleship is about learning. And in Simon Peter, we have a wonderful example of a man who was not too proud to learn, even in his older years. So this idea of learning to follow Jesus is not something that, you know, you do a course, uh, you get a certificate, and that, now you, you can do it. It's something which is a lesson throughout life, don't you think? But Simon Peter also had to become a leader, not just a learner. He had to allow others to follow him. He had to set an example. He had to give direction and guidance uh, for people to follow. So the difference between um, the two subjects, really, following is about being a sheep. Now, in those times in Israel, if you go to Israel today, uh, or you go to the Middle East today, and you do get to see uh, a shepherd boy with his sheep, uh, you'll see it, it's true, the sheep follow the boy. They, they do. I've seen it. They follow him. So not like in Wales uh, and the West Country, where the dogs uh, circle the sheep and snap at their heels and drive them forward. In the Middle East, the voice of the shepherd is recognized by the sheep and they follow him or her. Right? So, so being a follow me, Jesus is saying, I've got a flock. I'm the shepherd. You're the sheep. You follow me. And that really is, is something that Peter tells us a lot about. Being a shepherd is a different thing, isn't it? Being a leader, looking after the sheep uh, is, is a different thing. And Peter developed that responsibility. Uh, and we can see that in the Acts of the Apostles. But let's look at what Peter uh, learned and the way in which Matthew's Gospel record portrays that. So I'm going to go very uh, rapidly through this because it was the earlier subject. So Matthew chapter 14 to 19, just look at this. And you know the incident so well, I don't really need to read the passages and describe them. But just notice, uh, or ask yourself, see if you agree, what are the lessons we're supposed to take? So in chapter 14, uh, they're in the ship and there's a storm and, and uh, they're tossed with the waves. Verse 24 says the wind was contrary and they see the Lord Jesus walking on the water. And Peter uh, realizes it is Jesus and he says, Lord, bid me come. And Peter gets out of the boat. And it's a most amazing thing. You think this is a crazy thing to do, to get out of a boat in a storm. And uh, Peter wanted to do that. And the first thing, which is the obvious thing, is Peter's desire to be with the Lord Jesus Christ was greater than anything else in his environment, wasn't it? You know, what the others didn't get out of the boat. You think, what, what was Peter thinking? Now, I, I wonder, was he right to get out of the boat? Should he have stayed in the boat? Because, you know, when in the other incident, we say, stay in the boat. In Acts chapter 27, we say, stay in the boat. That's the lesson. <laughs> Don't get out of the boat. You know, you're safe in the boat, the ecclesial boat is, is the ark. That's where you're going to be safe. But in this case, Peter gets out of the boat and the Lord doesn't rebuke him at all. He says, come. And uh, I just would love to ask him what it felt like, you know, to put your foot on water and, and you're walking as on ice. <laughs> uh, I don't think he thought about that too much because once he saw the waves, of course, he started to sink. And the lesson... I think the, the, the most obvious lesson is that unless we look at Jesus, unless we focus on the Lord, then the storms of life are going to drown us. And, you know, thinking back to uh, those examples I, uh, I mentioned earlier on of our brothers and sisters from other countries who come under different routes and for different circumstances, but because they want to know more about the Lord Jesus Christ, the storms that they are suffering, you know, are, are immense. And, you know, I think, what can we say? But it's their desire to know Jesus. The Lord Jesus, die to understand him, to the attraction. You speak, speak to our brothers and sisters and you say to them, well, what was it? A few years ago now in, in Germany, what was it? And you know what the answer was? Jesus. 
it sounds obvious now, it? It, was, it was the character of the Lord. That was what was so attractive. And that's where they start. Some says, would you want to read the Bible? Can I? Yeah, have a look. And that has drawn them. The character of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, we, we can't underestimate that. That's why we need to absorb, you know, and, and immerse ourselves in the scriptures, not just as a matter of rote reading, but, but immerse ourselves in the company of the Lord. Because he is immensely attractive. You know, and, and that means that when we, are, we feel that strength, that then we realize that's the most important thing. And where is he? That's where we want to be. So in every discussion and every debate and in every controversy, the question is, brothers and sisters, in every family situation and every ecclesial situation, where is the Lord? What path is he taking? And that's what we're trying to find out. Not what I think, what you think. But I don't think it's important. Well, I think it's very important. Does the Lord think it's important? As he has instructed his apostles to teach us, sometimes people want to make a distinction between, say, the Gospels and the Epistles, or the Epistles are just, oh, that's Paul, isn't it, you know? Where did Paul come from? The Lord Jesus chose him, filled him up with the Spirit, and sent him to us to teach us how to be disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. So no good saying, oh, that's just the Apostle Paul. We can't possibly say that, can we? He's the man that Jesus chose. Right? We, it, every word of God is pure. So what does the Lord want us to do? Well, how are we going to know? Unless you've got a special revelation, tell me how to get it. But how do you know the word of God? So exposition and careful study of God's word is how we learn. I say that's so obvious. It's too obvious to say, isn't it? So when we get these situations, I've not even opened the Bible to, to get that instruction. Are we drifting away from the source of knowledge to be a disciple? And of course, we're under the pressure of a Western society. We in the West. Our Middle Eastern brothers and sisters, not yet under that pressure. They're under a different sort of pressure. But we're in the West, are under a postmodern pressure to extol individualism and rely upon feelings. This is what I feel, and rely upon that feeling rather than reason, which is rejected as modernism. This is postmodernism. We can't trust reason. We're not talking about human reason. We're talking about God and the Lord Jesus Christ's reasoning. That's what we're talking about, not human philosophy and human psychology. No, I don't trust it either. The word of God, if they speak not according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. It says, Isaiah chapter 8, seal the law amongst my disciples. Right? So we have to go back to Scripture. He said, oh, we've been pharisaical. No, it's not been pharisaical. Do you think the Pharisees studied scripture? No, they did not. What is chapter 15 all about? Look at chapter 15 of Matthew. Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? That's what they were studying. They would study the actual words of God. They, would stu they were studying the human philosophizing on that word and, and the, the extrapolations in exquisite detail about how much of an arm you need to wash in order to have washed your hands when you come back from the market. <clears throat> they had missed the spirit. And why? Verse 7 of Matthew 15, ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, this people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, but in vain they do worship me. Strong words, eh? The Lord saying them. Strong words, quoting Isaiah. In vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So we would verge away from anybody who says, oh, this is what human philosophers are saying. This is what, what uh, you know, the best uh, 
uh, scientists are saying. We don't trust that. But to trust our feelings is to go right against scripture, for the heart is deceitful above all things. Who can know it? So to the scriptures, they speak not according to this word. And that's where we need to learn from. And so in this chapter, which is about tradition versus truth, and the Lord offers a parable, they be blind leaders of the blind and so on. Peter says in verse 15, declare unto us this parable. And the Lord says unto him, are ye yet without understanding? Do you not yet understand? You see, there's an expectation on us that we will grow in understanding. The Lord is saying, Peter, don't disappoint me. <laughs> you know, how long have you been coming with me now? And how many parables have I explained to you? And you can't, and haven't you got it yet about what defiles a person? It's the heart. It's the heart. That's the point. So Peter takes that rebuke of the chin. He doesn't get offended. He doesn't go away. He said, I've stayed around here to be insulted. <laughs> He's wonderful, isn't he? He's just such a lovely character. You can see him going, oh, yeah, of course I <laughs> Sorry, I, I got it now. <laughs> And then you see in chapter 16, when the Lord says, well, who do you say I am? From chapter 11 to chapter 16 of Matthew, we've come to the point of the Lord's ministry where there's a lot of stock taking. In chapter 11, even John Baptist in prison sends a message, are you the one? I think it's a genuine question. I don't think that's for his disciples' sake. I think John the Baptist wanted to know if Jesus was the one. Why? Because he's still in prison. And all the prophecies of Isaiah said, what's the Messiah going to do? He's going to release the prisoners. <laughs> and there he is in prison. Well, aren't you the one? And people said, well, perhaps he's John the Baptist. Perhaps he's one of the prophets. Perhaps he's Jeremiah. Perhaps he's Elijah. Who do you say that I am? And this is where Simon Peter makes this wonderful declaration. Yeah. Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And the Lord says to him something very interesting. He says unto him, flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. What does that mean? Flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And what the Lord is referring us back to is chapter 11 of Matthew, where the Lord says in verse 25, at that time Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and hast revealed them unto babes. Right? Revealed them unto babes. For flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Right? And how did that happen? Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight, all things are delivered unto me of my Father. No man knoweth the Son, but the Father, neither know any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Peter had learned from heaven by listening and watching the Lord Jesus Christ, the works of the Father done by the Son, the words of the Father spoken by the Son, had revealed to Peter that this was indeed the Christ, the Son of the living God. For us, it's the word of God. It's the same, isn't it? Because those words are written down for us. So he makes this wonderful declaration based now on a true understanding and the Lord says, Thou art Peter upon this rock. And the rock, I believe, is the rock of Peter's faith, not Peter himself. Right? It's a difference, isn't it? We don't put our faith in a man other than the Lord Jesus Christ. But then, what a lesson he gives us, because only a few minutes later in the text, anyway, the Lord is telling them in verse 21 that he has to go to Jerusalem and be killed. And verse 22, Peter takes him aside. I don't know how old Peter was. He might have been a bit older. He might have had a, a paternal uh, regard for the Lord. You know, now, now, Master, you know, just come aside. Now, let's, don't talk like this. Let's, you know, have pity on yourself. You know, don't, don't, don't be defeated now, you know, going so well, just because 
quite a few people are turning away just because Herod's after you, just because the authorities are sending up people from Jerusalem to catch you up. You know, don't let that get you too much. And it was inappropriate, it was inappropriate to teach the Lord. It's always inappropriate to teach the Lord, isn't it? And the Lord says in verse 23, in the most uh, robust terms, get thee behind me, Satan. Huh? For thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, if any man will come after me, you see, get thee behind me in the right position to come after me. Right? He's in, at this moment in time, he's standing in front of the Lord, instructing Jesus as to what Jesus should be saying and not saying. Sometimes we're like that. When we want to say what's right and wrong, when it's contradicting what the scriptures plainly teach. Because we say, oh, it's, it's, you know, didn't mean it for us. Or, oh, it was just for them. Or, you know, you've got to, it wasn't fully inspired, it's, you know, it is his own weakness. No, brethren and sisters, it's the word of God. We put ourselves in the proper position behind the Lord, following him, not in front, telling him not to go there. That's, that's what Peter's teaching us. So Peter took it on the chin again because he's still with the Lord. Imagine being called Satan by Jesus. Imagine that. In chapter 17, the Lord says, Peter, you come up with the two others up the mountain. So, so the Lord actually is really bearing with Peter and he's going to show him the kingdom. He's going to give him the transfiguration. Peter's going to speak out a turn again. But the voice from heaven is going to say, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him, Simeon. Hear him. Let's stop talking. Stop talking. Listen to him. That's what you've got to learn as a disciple. Listen to him. And that is going to be a lesson. So when we come to chapter uh, chapter 17, we looked at the redemption, you know, and that's a beautiful point. In chapter 18, it's now about how you're going to become a shepherd in ecclesial life. How is Peter going to... Uh, you know, translate what he has learned now in to help the ecclesia. So chapter uh, 18 has the, the word ecclesia, verse 17, twice. There's only three times in the whole of the Gospels the word ecclesia is found, and two are there, and one is in chapter 16. So this section is about the ecclesial life. And the Lord is talking about how to deal with offences for those who, who, who are uh, unrepentant and eventually says if they won't listen take two or three and if they won't listen then take it to the cliche and if they still won't listen then you withdraw fellowship from them you now the lord says that it's not me saying that it's not krista delphin saying that it's not robert robertson who worked that you know who laid down that law it's the lord jesus because there's a separation between light and darkness because there's no fellowship between light and darkness it's not helpful for that person who has gone astray to pretend that they haven't because their eternal life is at stake. So, you know, that's what he says. But there are other things which are passed over, ought to be passed over in chapter 18. And they're the needles and, and the minor things, the, the, the trivial things which can be so large in our minds, verse 21. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Now, we don't know what the sin was. Probably there was something going on. Was it Andrew or somebody else? And, you know, you wonder whether Peter's uh, taken offense against Andrew. And you think to yourself, well, Andrew was the one who introduced him to the truth. <laughs> Wasn't that the greatest gift a brother could give another brother? Why would you be so mean? Why would you count offenses? Why would you say, Andrew, that's the seventh time? <laughs> and then that's the Lord saying, okay, count up the 490 then. <laughs> if you're counting, count the way God would count sins against you and me if God counted sins. 
and you could imagine Peter saying, oh, done it again, put my foot in it again. But what a lesson for us all to learn that without forgiveness, ecclesial life can't work. Without making allowances, without letting things pass, without not counting things, we're not going to make progress because we've all, I said, Paul Peters, and I wish I was. You know, we're all sheep that are drifting away or bouncing up against each other sometimes, you know, getting in the way of one another, competing for the grub, getting the best grass, you know, as sheep do. But as soon as the shepherd calls, you go, let's go. <laughs> it's what brings us back into the right direction. And so Peter learns and he makes mistakes. He learns he makes mistakes. And then he makes three mistakes. Self-confidence is no substitute for faith. Though all men forsake thee, yet will not I. You know, and what did he say? You know, the Lord, it says in, uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, that the Lord met Peter separately. He was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. And we, we wonder what that conversation was. I think it was there that Peter was able to say to the Lord, probably in floods of tears, I'm so sorry. I am so sorry. Because in chapter 21 of John, he doesn't say sorry. I think he said sorry already. He's poured his heart out to the Lord. And the Lord has said, I know I was listening. I know I saw, but Peter, you're the one that Isaiah spoke of, I was talking to. You were going to take that example wherever you go in the ecclesial world, and for thousands of years later, everyone will learn from what you did. And Peter took that message from ecclesia to ecclesia, and they said, they said, Peter, it was you. Yeah, that was me. And you can imagine the youth, going, where did you hide the sword? Yeah. And, you know, it wasn't a very good shot. You didn't cut his ear off. And Peter be saying to them, I want aiming for him. I was aiming for Judas. But remember what the Lord said, he that lives by the sword will die by the sword. I shouldn't have done it. I shouldn't have done it. I shouldn't have done it. And he take his story, you know, he's part of it. He's an actor in the, in the gospel record. He's an actor in the prophecy of Isaiah. What humility is required to do that? And here we have then, see, in chapter 21, that threefold affirmation before the other disciples. Do you love me more than these? And... The wonderful thing is, and we know the answer, Peter says, you know that I have affection for you. He can't use the word agape, can he? He can't use the word agape. Why? Because he knows that agape is what the Lord Jesus Christ showed when he laid down his life. And Peter knows that he never attained to that love. He thought he had it, but he had a strong affection for the Lord. It didn't verge on <coughs> self-sacrifice at that point. Did he love more than the other disciples? Because that's what he professed that he did. Second time, do you love me more than these? No, I have filio for you. And the third time he was really upset because the Lord says to him, have you got affection for me? And he was upset now. Don't deny me that. <coughs> I know I can't say agape. I know I can't say agape. You know, agape is manifest in what I do, not my words. But you know, I have got deep affection for you. And you know, that it's on the basis of that deep affection that the Lord is going to entrust him with a life of service, 
a life of agape. And the three things he says, firstly, feed my lambs. Secondly, feed my sheep. Thirdly, feed my sheep. Now, the feed my sheep in verse 16 and 17 is not exactly the same. So it's feed my lambs, shepherd my sheep, and feed my sheep. So you've got three different stages, feeding the lambs, teaching the little ones, Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 3, and teaching the word of God, the first principles. Secondly, shepherding the sheep, laying down rules for ecclesial life, setting up uh, you know, the seven to look after the widows and, and making sure the welfare system is working, making sure that we, we understand you know, that we need to give to our brothers and sisters who don't have what they need to survive. And then the third thing is to grow in understanding, to feed the sheep, the epistles, right? the word of God, strengthening us in our faith. That's the process that Simon Peter uh, was asked by the Lord Jesus Christ to, to, uh, to develop and become uh, disciple number one and apostle number one, the one who organized the first ecclesial gathering in Jerusalem. Well, the Acts of the Apostles goes on. There's just one last thing I wanted to say uh, in the time that has already run out, really. And that is, in Galatians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul describes how he had occasion to rebuke Peter. As Peter was being swayed by the Judaizers. Peter was being swayed by the Judaizers. He was such uh, so strongly Jewish in his, in his instincts that the teaching that he should not break bread or not eat, or not company the Gentiles, had been so ingrained into him that when this re-emerged in the in the, the ecclesia through the Judaizing influence, he was, you know, he was compromised. He was pulling back from reaching out to the Gentiles. And the apostle Paul has to rebuke him. Right? Now, that is something, isn't it? Now, Peter is the great apostle now. He's not just disciple number one. He's, he is the grand old man. Right? He's the one who walked on water. He was one who was there at the death of the Lord, at least in the condemnation of the Lord. He was the one who'd seen the empty tomb, hewn out of a rock, as Isaiah 51 said he was. Look into the rock from whence you are hewn. Now, how would he react to Simon Peter? How oh, sorry, how would Simon Peter react to the Apostle Paul? Having been rebuked and put in his place and instructed by this young man. But what we find in Acts chapter 15 is that when he gets an opportunity now to give his judgment on the situation, Jew versus Gentile. He makes a wonderful, positive statement of the truth. And it's faith, not law, which saves. Beautiful. It's exactly what Paul would have wanted him to say, and he says it. But this is what so impresses me about it in 2 Peter chapter 3. When, he, when he's writing at the end of his life about the Apostle Paul, who had publicly rebuked him in front of a large number of people. This is what he can say. Verse 15 of 2 Peter 3. And account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Even as our beloved brother Paul also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. Isn't that beautiful? The man who had reminded him of the truth. What a blessing Paul had been to him. His beloved brother. Now, there's the spirit, brothers and sisters. The true spirit, both of discipleship and shepherding. Because what an example he sets for us to follow as we together in these last days seek to follow our Lord Jesus Christ 
by faith.